Good morning. Um, how, how is everyone doing? Do you have any questions about the homework project? I see some, some emails floating around. Um, so, and, and I don't know why, but the email system seems to be very slow. I sent a response last night and it only got out today, right? Um, so one of the questions was, you know, how do we do implement LRU and whether you should do um, the other stuff? We'll see some of them today in terms of um, LFU or, or what have you, right? And most of the reasons why you do this because the hardware cannot do do things. But for your simulator, you can assume you you, know, you have access to the future and the past, right? So. You could implement LRU whichever way you want. You can actually have a table and, and maintain stuff, right? So I wanted to implement the vanilla, you know, LRU policy, and not worry about what particular hardware you do, right? And someone had a question about how to figure out how many frames you need, you know, the the base case, right? So did everyone figure out how to do that? It's you know, you can write a small shell script uh, and little C program to solve that. You know, essentially, you take the address, you can do a um, you know, bit operator 13 to shift it 13 bits, right? Then that'll, that give, that'll give you the page number. So if you wrote, wrote a program which will read a address, shift it by 13, print it out, right? And whatever it prints out, let's say that's your program, I mean, there are many ways to do this, but this shell script would get you the answer, right? Essentially, this this sort minus u would sort all. I mean, this is in Unix, of course, but you know, you essentially sort all the pages and get a unique list of frames, and then you count how many you you need, right? This is not the only way to do that, but this should get you. The answer in a few minutes. Right? See, so you, you know, you take your address, shift it by 13, print it, and then run it through a little shell script like this, and then you'll get the number of frames. And you can use that for your half and quarter and what have you. Right? Does that make sense? So if you, if you don't know sort, you know, you look up the man page and stuff, and there are other ways to do that. But this little thing should work. Um, but for anything else, you know, let me know. I mean, either send me an email or um, do you have any other question? Yeah. Yes. Um, when it says to run pin through your memory simulator, what does that exactly mean? I'm then. So like, when it says like step three, run pin through your memory simulator. What yeah. Does that mean? So I, I meant pin your program. I forget what the options are, right? But uh, so I gave you two traces. The third one is run your program on, let's say, trace one or something. Okay. Right. So I want you to run your program through pin to see what your own program does in terms of memory accesses. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I didn't specify <coughs> what exactly you should run it with. You know, choose something. Right. Choose something which is not humongously long. So don't run it through something which will. How many of you have used the pin tool? You'll notice it creates files which are fairly large, right? Two, over two gig. Yeah, so I mean, the, the first trace is for echo, nothing, right? And that's like a, I forget what the size is, but it's, 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 it's pretty big, right? Yeah, your, your typical program goes through a lot of pages. So if you <coughs> give this trace out for something very large, which takes a long time, then your trace would be really humongous. Which doesn't change anything. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't change anything with your program, except your program will take longer, and you may uncover bugs in your program which you haven't fully debugged, right? I mean, you know, you, you may. So keep it simple, but I want you to run it on, on this. The reason why I want you to do this is if you ever look at the traces, you may see what is happening because you wrote the program, so you kind of know what the program flow is, and you can kind of look at that to see what the memory traces were. Right, but as echo and stuff, you have no idea what, what really happened. Right? And for the next exam, I think few of you wanted to do it over the uh, spring break and stuff. So 
How many of you would like to do it during the spring break or whatever? Um, so what I can do is on Friday I can give out the exams, put an envelope or something, and you can take it and do it at your leisure and, and bring it back, right? For others, they can come back and do it on the thing, right? I'm not going to be there on that Monday, so um, so whichever way, if you want to do it. Talk about a take-home exam for spring break. No, it's not spring or take-home, right? It's the same same exam that I'm going to give for the class, the same half an hour, but if you don't want to do it after spring break, or if you don't want to come to class after spring break, because I think some people are traveling and all those things, right? I don't want to do it during spring break. <laughs> so, so I'm saying you can do whichever way. I won't be back oh. till Wednesday, right? Okay. Um, so, you can either do it, come back, or if you, I mean, you can come back on Monday. Don't have to come to class and do it somewhere. I have no problem with that, right? But only for people who want to do that. Now, of course, uh, there'll be somebody here who will practice the exam and stuff. But, um, and again, you will only get half an hour, and you have to promise me that you won't do anything else. Yeah. I mean, you, you, have to, you have to promise me that you won't use more than what you have access to here. I mean, you won't use Google search or something. You won't take more than half an hour. You won't look for answers from your friends and all those things. I'm not going to be here Friday. I'm sorry? What if, we're, what if we're traveling on Friday? Um, then I can send it to you by email. Okay. Yeah, I think some, some of you are leaving the country, right? So, yeah, if, if for people who are traveling and people who don't want to keep this through spring break and stuff, you can do it before. But the exam will cover whatever was covered on Friday. So if you want to do it on Friday. You can um, get a lecture notes though, right? Yeah, yeah. No, so, but if you want to do it at 11.30, right, you better be sure that you know what was covered in the lecture. Okay, so that, that's all the administrative stuff I have. Um, yes? Just one, uh, part of the test. If, if you take it and you do it at home, you have to bring it in on Monday, though? By the uh, class, or I can give it you one second? You can give it to me on Wednesday. Okay. You can email it. I'll, I'll bring it in. And it will be the same as the other one with minus points for wrong answers? Yeah. Same style? Yeah. Okay. Unless someone has a reason or suggestion of a variant which is uh, better or something. Um, the, the, the grades look fine, so I, th I think, you know, we'll stick to that. Um, okay, so. Are there any questions about the paging stuff that we looked at so far? So when we left off in the last class, we were trying to look at page replacement algorithms, and we we're trying to figure out, you know, what order they should they should be replaced and stuff. And we we're looking at reference string, right? But I want to reiterate what we are trying to do with this whole module, right? In, in the first two modules, we we're looking at processors, and you need a processor to make progress. And if you don't have a processor, you don't make progress. In this model, we're trying to see how we can make the memory go further by paging, you know, by moving pages in and out. Um, so you don't need to have paging at all. I mean, you, you can operate without paging. Essentially, you, your system will be sort of inefficient. It, it can only run as much <coughs> physical memory that you have, right? Whereas in the CPU case, if you don't have CPU, you, you can't you can't do too much. So. You're trying to make sure that you move all this stuff and still get good performance. You're trying to make sure that, because going to a disk, going to a, um, something in the higher up in the memory hierarchy is extremely slow. So you want to make sure that things are in the memory, you know, close to you, memory or, or cache or what have you. And that's what the focus here is, right? And for doing a lot of this stuff, you need hardware support. And most of these things are optional. And you have to remember, all these policies, regardless of what you do, your program will run slow, but it should not fault. It should not do anything wrong, right? Instead of using you know, FIFO, if you use LRU or what have you, depending on what programs you use, and your program, your, your project will, will show you, different programs will have different page faults, right? But the page fault is not essentially making your program give wrong results. It's, it's just making it run slower, right? So what we, we, we left off is we had this reference string and we looked it through FIFO. And with three frames, it gave you um, a, a number. With four frames, it gave a larger number. So in, in a graph form, once you have more pages, you have 
more page falls, right? This is kind of not what you would want because if you add more memory pages, you want the system to work better, and, and if you define better as less page falls, you know, adding one more page actually made you do one more page fault. And this is called Belladay's anomaly, and it happens for a class of algorithms. So when you define an algorithm, you have to make sure that it won't have this mm -hmm. property, right? And we're not going to actually go through the property of how, how, what, what, how you figure this out. Essentially, you want to make sure that the number of pages that you have in, in the memory depends on n. So if it depends on n, then if you increase more, then you know your you you will not run into this anomaly, right? So that so when people noticed that in 60s and 70s, so it was not uh, you know so it, it it was they needed some way to figure out how these page replacement algorithms and all work. So there's a lot of work done on trying to find the optimal algorithm, optimal in the algorithm sense, in terms of trying to figure out what is the least amount of page falls that a particular program would would need. And you can't implement optimal algorithm for the same reason that you can't, it, it needs the notion of future, right? Essentially what the algorithm suggests is you should replace the page which will not be used for the um, longest period of time in the, uh, in the future, right? So we start every pages, page request in the future and figure out the one which will be used the furthest out in the future and we replace that. So if you have, this set of frames you know, want to you know, that that uh, reference string, and if you have four pages, essentially you will get that one. So first you have one, you know, one, two, three, four, and then the fifth one is already there. So you know, six, two oh. is already there. The seventh five is not there, and the the one which will not be used the furthest. So from five, you have to look in the future, right? And if you look in the future, four is the furthest away, so you replace four with five. And when you come to four, um, when you come to four, you have to figure out in the future to see where which one to replace, and then replace that with that one. Right? So if you knew the future, you can do this, and you can prove that for this particular trace, you cannot do any better than six page falls. And you do this to figure out how well your algorithm is working. So you would essentially do this, find out what the number is, and then write a simulator like what you guys are, are working on, and trying to figure out what your, what your page file algorithm is trying to do, and then try to say something about how close you are to the op optimal algorithm. Right. And here is a, here's another longer string, which is in your paper, which, which, which is in your book. And essentially here, the, the blue bars are when, when the particular event happens, right? So I'm not gonna go through each one of them, but essentially the first few strings, you know, the seven comes in, then seven and zero, seven zero one, and then when two comes in, right, you have to look in the future to see um, which one would be used the furthest into the future, and seven is all the way towards your right. So you replace that with seven and so on. So if you run this algorithm, you'll, you'll, you'll figure out what the optimal number is. And in fact, you can do that for your simulator basically by looking in the, in the future, right? And since you have access to the future, you can, you can do that. And since we don't have access to future, we do something similar to what we did for processor scheduling, right? We, we don't know what is, the pro, what is the thing which should be used further into the future, so we look in the past to make a guess on what that number would be, right? So the logic here is, if you use least recently used, we assume that the one which is least recently used will continue to be least use recently used for the future, right? So the least recently used would more likely be the one which would be used further out in the future, right? That's a hypothesis, and that with that you can actually make the system work, and as you can imagine, that does not have to be true all the time, right? So. So if you have something, and if you have x, y, z, and you are at this point, right? So your logic is, if x was not used for the longest, then most likely x will not be used for the longest time in the future, right? X, this was large, so x would also end up somewhere here, and that's why LRU works, right? 
Can you think of a program segment where this will be not true? Yes. If you have, say, uh, four different pages and it always uh, accesses them in sequential order, so like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. then the, the one that was least recently used is always going to be the next one used. Yeah. So, you know, pictorially, it's more like this, right? If you have a while loop, while loop kind of thing, right? And this one was page one, page two, three, and four, right? And if you had only three pages, right? So when you come here, this, 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 and at this point, LRU would say, this is the, um, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, it'll replace, this will work, right? It'll replace this with something, and then you keep switching, right? Um, so if, if, if the one that used the latest is, is the one that's going to be used uh, immediately, right, then this will fail. So the assumption that the hope is if it doesn't happen after, the hope is this is rare. And the reason why you know it's rare is exactly what you're trying to do for your homework project. You collect traces, you look at these traces, you look at traces for all common programs, right, and see if, if the, those programs exhibit this behavior. And if they do, then it's a good policy. And this, they, the, over the years, LRU seems to work good for most applications, and so we, we use that particular model, right? So the, the question that somebody asked was, LRU requests you to kind of sort all the pages based on when they were referenced, right? And this cannot be done by the hardware. I'm sorry, it can be done by the operating system, right? Even, even numbers why? If you have a bunch of pages, and I want to figure out what's the least recently used page. The OS cannot know that by itself, right? That's my claim, and, and do you know why? We actually talked about this in the previous class. So if there are three pages, right? The OS needs to know what was least recently used. And I'm saying the OS cannot know that by itself without hardware help. Yes? I suppose, I mean, the, the pages could be in the cache of the CPU. That is, so the CPU is updating that cache, and the OS has to be aware of what's going on mm -hmm. in the cache. Yeah, that, that's, that's one answer, right? Yeah, the, the CPU could be doing something in cache that the OS does not know about. Going back to what happens when you do the page replacement and all those things, right? So OS decides that page, you know, so let's say three goes here, four goes here, five goes here, right? And then it gives control to the hardware to go, right? And the hardware is running a program, and the program may access this sometimes, this access sometimes, this sometimes, this sometimes, right? So when the hardware gives control back to the OS saying, I need a new page, do something with these pages, right? Did that answer ring a bell? Remember what happens, like you get a page fault, right? The OS figures out what pages should stay in memory right now, and after it figures it out, gives control back to the hardware, and the hardware goes away, right? And then eventually, it only gets control when you get a page fault. Right, it does not get control otherwise. So when it gets a page, when it gets control back, it has to figure out what was the least recently used. Recently, recently used by your program, right? So what would it need to figure out what that recently used is? Or why does it require help from the hardware? 
necessarily know the number of accesses on that particular page. Yes, the, the OS has no control after it does this. You know, it puts on these pages and gives it to the to the machine to run, but it does not know anything. I mean, OS does not get involved at all after that, right? So it decides that three and four and five should be there, but your program may actually be looping on page five and never touch three and four, right? So unless the hardware says something, from the OS perspective, it thought three, four, and five are good pages to be in memory. But it has no way of knowing what is getting actually accessed, right? And that's that's important thing to remember. So once you get the page fault and everything, and you give control back to the hardware, the OS is out of the loop. So unless the hardware gives you something back, OS has no way of knowing whether the page was accessed or not, right? So if the OS does not give you that back, so when you come back, all you know is three, four, and five are there. You have no idea of when they were accessed, how much they were accessed, or or any of those, right? So you essentially need some kind of a support from the hardware to say the page was accessed, right? So one way to do that is every time you access a page, you can tell the OS, and right? you can say I'm accessing a page OS. And the way you can do that is to make this page always invalid, right? All the pages invalid, and every time you access a touch a page, you get a page fall. OS says, oh, okay, I'm just counting, so I'll keep the counter up, go back, right? That'll that'll work to solve the LRU problem. What would be the problem? What what would be the negative of downside of doing that? I believe all the pages has invalid. And assume that the hardware gives you invalid bit. You leave all the pages as invalid, and that means anytime anybody touches the page, you'll get a page fault, right? And in this case, OS knows that the page is valid. It intentionally set the page bit to be invalid. So it can keep a little table here, and whenever it gets a page fault on this table, it'll increment whatever here, plus one, and so on, right? And that way, it can actually implement a true LRU functionality, right? Because it can figure out how many times that thing has access and stuff. What would be the problem with uh, such an approach? Yeah, it'll be it'll be extremely slow because every time you page fall, OS gets involved. Right? If you th if you think of the timing, right? Mm -hmm. if, it, if you say get a two gigahertz, one gigahertz processor, right? That means it's in, in it's running one million instructions per second, right? And each instruction could potentially request many memory accesses, right? So one of the examples we talked about was if you say A equals B plus C, where A, B, C are memory locations, right? And you have an add instruction, right? And assume this these instructions are all aligned properly that they're not half in one page, half in another page, right? So how many page faults could this instruction potentially um, get? Right? A is in the memory location, B is in memory location, C is in memory location, and you're trying to add this stuff, right? How many page files could you potentially get? Yes. Hmm? Three. Do we have a higher number? Yes. Could it be four if you have to look at the add instruction? Yeah. Yeah, so three for these data ones, but add is also an instruction which could be paged in, right? Yeah, so you could actually potentially have four of those, right? Um, regardless, I mean, there, there are so many of those, right? And if you did a bad job, it could actually be more than that. Bad job is if you bring in C and if you bring in B, and then for bringing in A, you replace what was in C, right? And then you kind of go back and forth, right? So, but you have a lot more page faults. So you would like, so if you, if you have a one gigahertz processor, you would like it to run one instruction. You like <coughs> to run, run billion instructions a second, right? Which means that you want this to run in one billionth of a second, ideally, right? If you're doing page faults, so in the case that we, we talked about, all the memory location, all the memory is, is, is all fine. The program can potentially actually run. I mean, you don't have to do a page fault. But if you force it to do a page fault, now you're creating four page faults. So even if you could 
sa satisfy a page fault in one instruction, right? And it's not possible because you have to get the OS involved, save registers back and forth, and all those things, right? Even in the absolute best case, if, if there's no cost, you still take four instructions, right? It'll take four, four times that they close the OS and does something. The reality is much more so than that. So this will run extremely slow. So you can't, you don't want to do that, right? So there's there's some things that in the next lecture I'll, I'll kind of um, lay it lay it out. I think we we talked about it as we move along, right? So one other thing is, anytime you have to, so you want the processor to run from the cache all the time. You don't want the processor to ever come to operating system if it doesn't have to. You don't want it to context switch and all those things. You want it to run as, as much as possible, independent of the OS, to get the most performance. Doing stuff like this would get the OS involved all the time, and it will slow you down. So if you don't have this, you have to have mechanism for the hardware itself to manage this counter. right? So you would you could either have this this counter instead of you maintaining a table for each page somehow the hardware defined fashion maintain a counter right and it's up to the OS to figure out when to make it zero and all the hardware does is whenever you access some page here it'll implement this counter right and that's one way to implement uh, LRU right if the hardware allows that then you set up this table such that there's a counter for each page, and whenever it's accessed, the counter would be incremented. And when you want to do a replacement, we go through the counter to figure out what was the least recently used page. Right? And instead of doing an add, which is actually potentially very slow because you need to read what is in the counter, add it, and then put it back, hardware traditionally tends to put some clock value in here. It, it puts the local, the current clock value, so it does not tell you how many times it was accessed. It'll tell you when it was accessed last, right? Based on the clock. So essentially, you will have like T1, T2, and T3. So if you are at time T4, you have to search through these things to figure out what was the um, least recently used, right? The, the good thing is hardware does all the stuff. The bad thing is you have to do a search, right? And depending on how this thing is assigned, you could either do a linear search, in which case it's, it's very slow, right? So if you, if you took the algorithm class, you would, have, you would have learned that linear search is order n. So number of pages defines how much time it, it takes for you to search this thing. So every time you get a page fault, you have to search through a potentially large number of frames, and that it's not a good thing, right? And again, that you, you may be forced to do that because that's what the hardware gives you. you know, so you go with whatever the hardware gives you. But if you do that, then you basically have um, the, the search problem. One way to avoid the search is to have a stack. Again, the hardware has to <coughs> provide this. Right? Essentially, you create a doubly linked list of all the pages. Whenever you access a page, you move that page to the top of the stack. right? And the bottom of the stack gives you the least recently used. So here it is in more pictorial fashion. So if you have such a reference string, right, at the point A, assume the stack was how it is over here. And it has 2, 1, 0, 7, 4. And when it wanted to bring 7, right, it, it has to be, so it's, it's not a like, traditional stack. It's not you know, push and pop. It's essentially you insert by moving things around, right? So over here, you were replacing, oh no, so you, you access two, so you moved, so two was the most recently used, so you moved it to the, to the top, sorry. At the point B, the seven was the least recently used, so seven moves up and everything else pushes down, right? So over here it was two, one, zero, seven, four, when you access 7, you figure out where 7 is, move it to the top, and leave the rest where they are. Right? So now if you want to replace something, 4 is the least recently used, and 7 is the most frequently used. Right? So you, you get the benefit of not having to search anything, but the flip side is you have to maintain these pointers. You have to maintain these, these doubly linked list pointers, and 
I think you need to swap six pointers to make make this happen. So every time a page is accessed, you have to do six pointers. And again, this has to be implemented by the hardware. So the hardware can do it in one class cycle here, good, but you know, it's done by the hardware. So both of those are fairly complex, and if the hardware can provide that, we'll, we'll, we'll get some benefits. You know, if, you, if you can do the counting or the, or, or, you know, the, the clock-based clock counter or the stack-based one. What most likely would happen is the OS would give you the reference bit that we, we, we saw before, right? And we can implement something on top of the reference bit. So reference bit basically says if a, if a, if a page was accessed, it's a bit field, so it only tells you whether the page was accessed, not when it was accessed or how many times it was accessed. So we can use that to figure out what happens is if, if the OS, whenever it gets a page fault, whenever, whenever it gets control, right, for whatever reason, when the timer goes off, it's trying to reschedule the process or what have you, right? If it goes and replaces all the reference bits to zero, right, and the next time it gets a chance, it goes back to see what the status was. Any page which has a one is considered to be recently accessed. Right? So the idea here is, let's say you have, say, three pages, and OS gets control at this point. Right? Before it proceeds, it makes all of them zero. Let, let, let me make it in a linear array, right? It makes all of them zero and gives control back to the hardware. And the hardware runs and everything. At some point in the future, right, T, let's say T plus delta, right? And delta is, is the, the timer that we did for the homework project. You know, every, every so often, the, the process gets interrupted and stuff. At that time, it looks to see what the status of the bit field is. If the bit field was 101, right? It will note, it'll, it'll keep a counter like before, right? And it'll increment this, it'll increment this field because these two were recently accessed. This was not referenced, so you leave it as it is, right? And you make these fields zero and let it go, right? So this is a crude way of implementing the counters we talked about. Essentially, at, at every so often, you need to read what the reference bit fields are and do the calculations yourself, right? The hardware only provides you with these reference bits, so it does not really tell you anything about if these two were one, it does not say which one was recently used. All you know is within this time, one of them was used, both of them are used concurrently. We, we, we don't anything beyond that, right? So we can use this to implement LRU at the granularity of this time, right? So we know that if a, if a page was accessed here or here, this is least recently used compared to this one. The time is going this way, right? But we have no way of knowing two pages here, and that may be okay for the most part, because we don't exactly precisely want to do LRU. We just want to find something which is way in the past, because all these are heuristics anyway, because we, what we really want is to know what is in the future, since we don't know what the future, what is in the future, this ought to work, right? So variation of that is to have additional registers. So some, some hardware lets you have, instead of one bit, multiple bits, right? The hardware will still only update one bit, but the OS can do something with it. So essentially what happens is, the every so often the clock, the OS will shift the bits, right? The hardware will continue to do like this, but what would happen is, let's say there are two bits, right? So there are two bits. When you started off, let's say it was like this, right? And I'm assuming the same case we had before, right? What would, would be is actually like this, right? Instead of one bit, now you have two bit. OS, the, the hardware only modifies the let's say the least significant bit. So this bit was flipped to one, this bit was flipped to one, the other bits were left as it is, right? OS once in a while comes in, does a 
left shift. So this becomes one zero, this becomes zero zero, this becomes one zero. Right. So every <coughs> clock cycle OS would do this shift, yeah, but the hardware would continue to work like we talked about before. So this is an easy way for you to keep track of what is happening. So this is a binary number, so we, this you can tell that the least recently used number was this, right? Because that's a smaller number compared to these two, right? So this is a way for the OS having to avoid keeping a separate table. The hardware still only flips one bit, but the software can make it look in like a counter. And that's the second approach. There are many variations of this, many ways of, of doing this replacement, and, and we'll look at two of them next, right? But the thing to remember is we are all trying to simulate the optimal algorithm, which we cannot implement because we don't know the future, right? And we basically go with what the hardware gives you and trying to do a good job, right? And that, that's the, that's the uh, big takeaway message. So the, the second, second chance algorithm says that if a, if a page was um, referenced recently, right, and if it, so second chance is, is essentially a FIFO algorithm, right? It basically replaces pages in a first in, first out, so it's not even implementing it as a LRU, because LRU means that you have to search through things to figure out what is the least recently used. So second chance algorithm is a, is a FIFO algorithm, and what we do is, if your chance, if you are about to be evicted because the clock came back to you, so you maintain a list of all the pages in a, in a circular list, then you go through them and try to remove what's the first in, first out. If you, were, if you had a reference bit of one, which means that you were recently accessed, I'll give you a second chance by flipping you to zero, right? So that when I come back next time, you would be evicted. So here's a figure of what would happen, right? So, over in the left, you have a circular list of pages, right? And you keep a pointer, it's the first in, first out, so you keep a pointer to see which one should be evicted, right? If the page that you want to evict is a zero, has a reference bit of zero, that means it has to be used in, in some time, right? So it can be safely evicted. If a page has a reference bit of one, we don't know when it was actually referenced, but we give it a chance by flipping the bit to a zero and letting you go, because the next time you come around this list, if you are a zero, you'll be replaced, right? So for example, in this case, you know, the, the, the or on the left, the next victim happens to be a one, right? So you flip it to zero, go to the next frame, that's a one, flip it to zero, and you replace the third page, right? If at this point we need, you know, like so, if you need another page, We'll, let's, let's ignore the dots for now. You'll take the next one, flip it to zero, next one, flip it to zero, and then we replace the, the, the one on the top, right? And the next place to be replaced is the one over the top. The next place to be replaced is the, is the one which we call next victim, right? So essentially I give you a second chance. So till the, so, you know, the, till the, the, the pointer goes around, you get a second chance, right? So it's a first in, first out with this one variation which, which prolongs how much time you get. <coughs> so it's an it's a approximation of the <coughs> least recently used, but in a vague sense, right? It's not exactly least recently used, but it's trying to see if you referenced it, then you get one more, one more cycle. If you haven't referenced it, then you, it's a FIFO. If all bits are zero, it's a FIFO. But for once, it essentially gives you one extra run, circle through that. Right. Does that make sense? So this is the easy way to implement LRU. So this is similar to what we did for the processors and stuff, right? We want to implement more complicated policies, but all of them are in critical paths. So if you're trying to do very smart stuff like you know, keeping counters and searching through all of them, you could potentially take a lot of time. So if you're taking a session like this and you're taking four page falls, you don't want to be doing too many complicated stuff. So something like this, it's not exactly giving you the least recently used, but it, it sort of works, and it, it's a very easy thing to, re, uh, to implement. And you look to see what the reference bit is, if it's one, make it a zero, and then you move on, right? So what would happen to a very popular page in this scheme? 
drummers so often that the drummers that would almost always be one. That way, even if it tried to get evicted once, by the time it got back to it, it would be set to one again. Yeah, exactly. Right. So if you have a very popular page, then essentially when you come come here, it'll be one. You set it to zero, but then the page you know will be accessed again, so it'll, it'll keep it'll go back to one. So popular pages will tend to stay. Only then popular pages will eventually try to go away, right? So, so this, um, so this is the reason why you know the, like the question that somebody asked, you know, what what do we do about LRU or should we do more complicated stuff, right? Um, <coughs> or LFU or something, right? You could do LFU if you want, but you don't have to because you have access to all the things. You, I'm not restricting you to any particular hardware. You can keep counters for to figure out what's the least frequently used, recently used, and, and what have you. So if you want to do LFU, that's fine, but you don't have to. I think LRU is much simpler for, for an hour program. Okay. And yeah, the, the other mechanism is if the hardware can give you a, a, a count, then you can, so if you, if, if you use the count, right, you don't actually know what is the least recently used, you only know what is the least frequently used, because the count, count essentially says how many times pages are referenced. So at least LFU algorithm would re replace the least frequently used based on the counter. So you essentially have to s sort all the count fields, find out the smallest count field, and replace that. This variation of that is MFU, which is the most frequently used, um, and, and and the logic, you know. So there are some programs, uh, some sequences where MFU works, there are some sequences that LFU works, and depending on what what people find, you'll change that. So I hope one of the things that comes through in all this stuff is writing operating system is not so much so much harder in terms of the techniques. I mean, all the techniques we we talked about could go into Linux or whatever operating system you can think of. The key is to figure out what particular variant that you would want to do to give you good performance for the programs that you would be running. Right? It's entirely dependent on the kind of programs you'll be running, and that is why I want you to look, look, look you know, try to understand what for the homework project. Right? Your three different races, chances are they all don't like the same algorithm. You know, maybe LRU works for something, second chance works for another thing, and so on. As an OS designer, you have to somehow figure out what is the best replacement algorithm for the most common sets of applications that people run, right? On a general purpose system where you don't even know what that is, right? What do people use, their, uh, let's say, the desktop? What do people use the desktop for? What is the most prevalent thing that you, any of you use your desktop for? Word. Okay. Email. Okay. What 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 program do you use? Uh, Outlook. Outlook. Okay. Anything else? Nobody plays games. <laughs> okay. Games, right? <laughs> um. So. You can't really run this. I mean, your your um, the pin tool running it on a game would would create so much data. You probably overwhelm you. Right? But think of what a game does and think of what Outlook does, right? In terms of imagine what those things do, right? Games do a whole lot of things different than what Outlook would do, right? Outlook is fairly boring and it checks an email and just sits there waiting for you to do something. Games are doing a lot of stuff. And what we'll see next is trying to, to capture that, you know, trying to capture what these programs do using, using no notations of working set and locality, right? But essentially, these two programs are completely different. You're trying to find a good set of things for both of them, right? And so you have to introduce the notion of locality to, to try to capture that. So the idea here is uh, something like a game. It, you know, it's all over the place in terms of memory references. You'll see that in your if you, when you run a pin on one of those, right? Some of the programs are very tightly uh, looping, and some of them are all over the place. And depending on what they are doing one of these policies would work good, right? So you try to optimize for those, right? So before we get there, you know, like the, some, other, some other stuff that we'll, we'll wrap up and I'll continue on the next class, right? So one of the ideas, is we talked about like page replacement and stuff being happening on the fly when you, when you want it. Usually the, the OS has some idle time, some free time, so it, it doesn't have to do it exactly when you want it, right? 
So one of the ways it can do that is it always maintains a free pool. So it, it, it never runs out of pages to the last bit. So it usually leaves a certain amount of pages free. So even if there is no processor which, which wants something, it'll keep a maintainer free list, right? So that when a new process comes in, it can keep going faster. Right? And that, that's optimization. You lose utilization, but you don't have to wait so much, right? So for example, if you want to replace a page which is, has to be written, right? You swap it. You basically say, I'll write this page after the disk. Once it's finished, we'll go back to the free pool. I'll give you something from the free, free pool so that process can continue. So you're kind of interleaving these things. Right? Um, the other stuff is periodically, so if, a, if a page is modified, <coughs> the OS has something to do and the hardware, the hard disk is doing nothing, periodically you go through the pages and see if a page was modified, and then you write it out. Right? You don't have to write it, but if you do that, then next time when the page is required, then you may not have to write it, wait for it at that point. The other thing you can do is you can take a page away from a process, but not really take it away. So you take a page from a process, put it in the free list, but maintain information that it came from this process. So if this process ever comes back and asks for this page, you just give it back, right? So you don't have to read it back from the disk. So there's some optimization you do to maintain a certain level of, of uh, free frames, right? And I'll finish with this, this one, one slide. So the, the next question we have to ask is, which we don't touch in the whole pro program, is we talked about frames, and we talked about frames being given to the processes and stuff. And you know, in a simulation, you, you're going to assume that all the frames are there for you to play with. right? But that's not really true in a real machine. A real machine has many processes. So the question is, who gets how much frames? Who gets how much, and, and when do they get it back and stuff? right? So. That's where the notion of a minimum frame comes in. So each process has to have at least a minimum number of frames depending on the particular hardware. So if, if your hardware, this is the most complicated instruction, then you need at least four pages. Right? If you don't have four frames here, then this particular instruction cannot complete in the first case. I mean, you know, you'll, you'll bring <coughs> in C, you'll bring in B, then you have to remove B to bring in A, and so on, so you don't make progress. So for a given machine, you figure out what is the least amount of frames that you need for an instruction to run, and you give that. So in IBM 370, it's six pages. For this, it will be four pages, and so on. So that's absolute lower bound, right? You can't go below that. And then we figure out how we, dis you know, what's the maximum, and we do that, right? And I'll continue with that on, on the next lecture.